Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 10, Text 10. And this is Jag Bharat in his um, encounter with Maharaj Rahugana. And we left off last time uh, in the middle of the uh, conversation that was taking place where um, the king had become very angry and disturbed by the way Jud Bharat was carrying the palakin. They were carrying the king in a in a palakin, and the other carriers were doing their job nicely. And because Jud Bharat was his consciousness was very different from those around him. He was a very elevated, spiritually elevated person, and he was careful not to step on little ants and insects and things. So they, the palakin was not being carried nicely. It was bouncing around. So um, Maharaj Rahugan has become uh, irate that this service isn't being done nicely, and he feels disrespected. And he's not aware of who he's talking to. He's talking to a very saintly person who shouldn't really be carrying the palanquin to begin with. <laughs> but um, it's a nice arrangement because the king will become enlightened. And no doubt all of those within earshot of this exchange and conversation will also um, get spiritual benefit. So. Such is the association of a pure devotee of the Lord. So any ordinary person would become very fearful if the king was personally angry at them. That could mean all kinds of punishment or inconvenience or whatever. But uh, Jed Barad's not, he's not identifying with the material world and He's not even slightly, even slightly disturbed. So, and he, he's beginning to talk. Now, we followed his previous births um, in his progress toward Godhead. Um, he was the son of Lord Shagdev, was an incarnation of the Lord. He took birth as the son of, of an incarnation of the Lord and didn't complete his progress um, at, toward the end of his life. He retired for, to devote completely to spiritual practice, to prepare for leaving the body, but became distracted by uh, attachment to a, he had a little pet that he developed a, friend, a fond, fondness for while he was in the forest. And unfortunately, at the time of death, he was thinking more of this pet than he was of God, so he got another birth, and that time in the body of a deer. But he had full consciousness of his mistake, so he waited out his time in the body of the deer, and now he's taken birth as son of a, a Brahmin in a Brahmin family. But because of his past experiences, which he has full consciousness of, he doesn't want anything to do with anything material. He just wants to fix his mind on Krishna and on God. No matter what happens, he's, he's ready to go. I mean, that's three births now, and that's ready. He's re that he has full awareness of his mistakes, and he's ready to go. <clears throat> So this is um, some of the things that are, are happening to him, some of his uh, pastimes, I said, <laughs> in, uh, in this uh, extremely renounced um, position. 
but it, it was said at least a few times in the past verses that although he was such an elevated uh, soul, such a pure devotee of the Lord, that but somehow his his aura, his his glow, or his magnificence uh, was not readily visible. He um, he appeared unkept and disheveled, and even dirty. He didn't bother to bathe so much. He, he didn't appear um, particularly effulgent. It was hard to I didn't see his effulgence because of his not speaking and acting like a deaf and dumb person. So this is who Maharaj Rahugana thinks he's talking to, just somebody who's like really dumb and incompetent. And now Maharaj Rahugana sees him as in, is not submissive either. But f but finally Jad Bharat is starting to speak. He hasn't spoken. He seems like for his whole life, really, he hasn't really said anything. And now he's speaking. Uh, Maharaj Rahugan has hurled some abuse at him and uh, spoken in uh, like a taunting way, saying different things to him because Maharaj Rahugan is angry. So now Jad Bharat is responding and he's giving transcendental knowledge. So this is uh, text 11, uh, text 10. Is it 10? Yeah, it takes 10. Fatness, thinness, bodily and mental distress, thirst, hunger, fear, disagreement, desires for material happiness, old age, sleep, attachment for material possessions, anger, lamentation, illusion, identification of the body with the self, are all transformations of the material covering of the spirit soul. A person absorbed in the material bodily conception is affected by these things, but I'm free from all bodily conceptions. Consequently, I'm neither fat nor skinny nor anything else you have mentioned. Prophet's Commentary Srila Nartan Das Thakur has sung, one who is spiritually advanced has no connection with the body or with the bodily reactions, actions and reactions. When one comes to understand that he is not the body and therefore is neither fat nor skinny, one attains the topmost form of spiritual realization. When one is not spiritually realized, the bodily conception entangles one in the material world. At the present moment, all human society is laboring under the bodily conception. Therefore, in the Shastras, people in this age are referred to as Dwipadapashu, two-legged animals. No one can be happy in a civilization conducted by such animals. Our Krishna consciousness movement is trying to raise fallen human society to the status of spiritual understanding. It's not possible for everyone to become immediately self-realized, like Jad Bharat. However, as stated in Srimad Bhagavatam, Nasta Prayeshu Abhadreshu Nicham Bhagavata Sevaya By spreading the Bhagavat principles, we can raise human society to the platform of perfection. When one is not affected by bodily conceptions, one can advance to the Lord's devotional service. Nasta prayeshu abhadreshu nicham bhagavata sevaya bhagavat yuttama sloke bhaktir bhavati naishtiki. The more we advance our freedom from bodily conception, the more we're fixed in devotional service, and the more we're happy and peaceful. In this regard, Srila Madhvacharya says that those who are too materially affected continue the bodily conception. Such persons are concerned with different bodily symptoms, whereas one freed from bodily conceptions lives without the body, even in the material condition. So that's the first step, is um, being able to distinguish spirit from matter. That has to be 
the first step in, in God realization. And I was in a conversation um, the other evening, and uh, one of the people asked, it's, I said, well, I went on a, a spiritual journey for most of my life trying to find what was, who was God, what was the meaning of life, like that. And they looked at me and they said, and did you find it? And I said, yes. And then I realized that they wouldn't be able to understand if I told them directly Krishna is the Supreme Personality of Godhead and he uh, has his own planet. and It would sound bizarre to them, although it's the truth, that without them, because this is realized knowledge, it's, without them somehow or other being able to become free from the identification of the body as the self, they really wouldn't have access to um, anything, any of the higher truths. That that is the very first step. That's why Bhagavad Gita is so very important. Because Bhagavad Gita is the very cornerstone of spiritual life, not this body. So it was a nice realization for me. And um, I wasn't really able to do too much in the conversation, uh, but um, we did direct it toward we're not this body or mind, we're spirit. And uh, so that did help. But without getting, at least on that platform, they really don't have access to um, the higher truths, the higher realizations. That has to be there. And so there is a practice for that. Association with devotees, hearing the scriptures, um, taking guidance from having a mentor, a spiritual mentor or a spiritual master, and um, following their instructions and um, inquiring from them, making friends with the devotees, avoiding bad association, which would be association that is simply uh, concerned with engaging in uh, sense activity, material, material sense gratification. So, um, it says, the more we advance our freedom from bodily conception, the more we're fixed in devotional service. So, there's different ways to get free from bodily conception, um, which would be liberation. And that can be done um, by those that just uh, use their mental abilities to um, mental speculation actually can bring someone to the point of being able to distinguish matter from spirit. But that's very, very difficult to do and there's still more to go after that. So simply by engaging in devotional service automatically um, it's included because Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and devotional service is one of his uh, energies, one of his potencies. And by coming in contact with that energy, that potency, that spirit of devotion, and come into contact with Krishna, And Krishna is the source of all knowledge, all renunciation, all beauty. 
the source of all the material worlds and the spiritual worlds. So what is there that isn't known when one comes into contact with Krishna? So causeless detachment from identification with the material energy is there. And one becomes aware of their own spiritual nature, which is different from the material nature. And the more one engages in devotional service, the more we're happy and peaceful. So it's a really delightful progression. But the first step <clears throat> is freedom from the bodily conception. And as long as a person thinks that they have a chance of enjoying materially, they just did this, or they just got that, or they just had this education, or they just just had this vehicle, or they just started this business and got some money, or they just had that particular partner in life, and they could enjoy. As long as that kind of mentality is there, <clears throat> a person's not going to be open to hearing that they're not this body or mind. But when there's some frustration, and there will be, <laughs> because these things are temporary, even if someone gets the education, the car, the job, the partner in life, even if they get them, <clears throat> and even if they're enjoying like anything, is only temporary. <clears throat> so at some point there will be frustration. And at that point, if the person asks a few very basic questions like, why? Why am I suffering? What happened? So go on to the next verse. Text 11. My dear king, you have unnecessarily accused me of being dead, though alive. In this regard, I can only say that this is the case everywhere because everything material has its beginning and end. And as far as you're thinking that you are the king and master and are thus trying to order me, this is also incorrect because these positions are temporary. Today you are a king and I am your servant, but tomorrow the position may be changed and you may be my servant and I your master. These are temporary circumstances created by providence. The bodily conception is the basic principle of suffering in material existence. In Kali Yuga especially, people are so uneducated that they cannot even understand that the body is changing at every moment and that the ultimate change is called death. In this life, one may be a king, and in the next life, one may be a dog, according to karma. The spirit soul is in a deep slumber caused by the force of material nature. He is put in one type of condition and again changed into another type. Without self-realization and knowledge, conditional life continues, and one falsely claims himself a king, a servant, a cat, or dog. These are simply different transformations brought about by the supreme arrangement. One should not be misled by such temporary bodily conceptions. Actually, no one is master within the material world, for everyone is under the control of material nature, which is under the control of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna, is the ultimate master. As explained in Chaitanya Charitamrita, Ekle Ishwara Krishna Arasabha Richa, the only master is Krishna, everyone else is his servant. Forgetfulness of our relationship with the Supreme Lord brings about our suffering in the material world. 
So the bodily conception is the basic principle of suffering in material existence. Hmm. We can see how uh, how merciful a devotee like Maharaj Rahu, uh, like um, Jud Bharat is. He's completely purifying the whole atmosphere by speaking the truth. Initially, he's being threatened by a very, very powerful person. This is the top administrative government official for the country. This is Maharaj Rahugana. And everyone kowtows to Maharaj Rahugana. Everyone pays taxes. When he says jump, they jump. And everyone wants to avoid his displeasure or his wrath. So he ha- he's the most powerful person. Okay? And then there's Judd Bharat, who has nothing materially. Nothing. No position. Um, he... The food that he eats is just whatever comes his way. He has no no house even. He's he's a completely renounced person. And he's being um, attacked by this very powerful person who's threatening to destroy him. He actually threatened to kill him. So, under those circumstances, he's very calm, he's he's undisturbed, he's not worried, kill me, don't kill me. He's just speaking the truth, the transcendental truth. And he's completely turning that whole atmosphere around. Completely. It's purifying the whole atmosphere by speaking this truth. This message of Godhead. And that's the power of a devotee, a pure devotee, a surrendered soul. And the Lord, the Lord uses such people. They speak on his behalf. He protects them. He inspires them. He enlightens them. He even gives them the words to say. <laughs> So, um, Jed Bharat is illuminating the difference between spirit and matter, and he's also describing the law of karma, how whatever position one is in in this life, it's according to karma. And next life could be something completely different. The laws of karma are so complicated that it's really not possible to predict what type of birth in the material world one will get. The the mind, the subtle body, is carrying the desires of the living entity since time immemorial. And as these desires surface, they carry the spirit soul to another gross manifestation, material, gross material body, to fulfill those desires or try to. And um, that's since time immemorial. So to sort all of that out within the spirit soul's subtle, subtle body, subtle mind, uh-uh. <laughs> it can't predict. It cannot be predicted. Although, when the spirit soul surrenders to Krishna and they begin to develop their spiritual body, that's totally predictable because it's based on spiritual desire for serving the Lord. 
can actually pick your spiritual body. <laughs> These are dealing with consciousness. Spiritual energy means conscious. Material energy means pretty much not conscious. The desi desires are there, but there's no consciousness. It's just material desires carrying the living entity from one gross manifestation to another. And the living entity is asleep. He's not conscious. In a, in a sleeping state, a comatose state, thinking that they're enjoying and suffering. But when the consciousness is awakened, and that comes through devotion to the Lord and the Lord's devotees, then the spiritual body begins to develop. And that is a conscious effort. It has to be. How can you develop a spiritual body in consciousness without being conscious of developing a spiritual body? doesn't work like that. It's full knowledge. Full bliss. Full eternity. See, really, it's like, how can you be conscious without being conscious? doesn't work. Conscious, you're conscious. So, there's some really big differences between material energy and spiritual energy. So by hearing about Krishna, then we begin to develop a desire to serve Krishna, and to serve Krishna, you have to have a spiritual body. So then the work is cut out for the aspiring transcendentalist, So here, the very basis of making that switch from unconscious state, identifying with matter and being carried by the laws of karma, and desires situated in the mind since time immemorial, material desires, Jed Bharat's flipping the switch. One is ahankara. I am this material body, and the other is Omkara, I'm spirit. He's flipping the switch for Maharaj Rahugana and for us because we're hearing this conversation. And that's what a devotee can do. That's the power of a devotee of the Lord. They can flip that switch. Text 12. My dear king, if you still think that you are the king, and that I am your servant, you should order me, and I should follow your order. I can then say that this differentiation is temporary, and it expands only from usage or convention. I do not see any other cause. In that case, who's the master and who's the servant? Everyone's being forced by the laws of material nature. Therefore, no one is master and no one is servant. Nonetheless, if you think that you're the master and I'm the servant, I'll accept this. Please order me. What can I do for you? Very interesting. He's not denying the situation, but he's explaining how it's temporary and that there's something more going on than, than simply uh, on face value. In other words, it's the laws of material energy, the uh, material nature, which is the modes of material nature, are conducting the activity. One is situated as, like Maharaj Rahugana was very much in the mode of passion and ignorance. So in that situated there, he's identifying with being the master. 
But Chad Barat's pointing out, well, who's the master and who's the servant? If this is all being conducted by the material modes, then who's the master and who's the servant? It's an illusion. But Judd Bharat says, but if you think you're the master and I'm the servant, it's just the body, so, okay, please order me. What can I do for you? Prabhupada's commentary. It's said in Bhagavatam, Ahamma Meti, one thinks, I am this body, and in this bodily relationship, he's my master, he's my servant, she's my wife, he's my son. All these conceptions are temporary due to the inevitable change of body and the arrangement of material nature. We're gathered together like straws floating in the waves of an ocean, straws that are inevitably separated by the laws of the waves. In this material world, everyone is floating on the waves of the ocean of nations. Yeah, that's a good example. Real good. Like straws floating together. Sometimes they're together for a little while, but by the force of the current, then they're separated. They have no control over it, really. It's material nature are these currents, and sometimes they unite people, and sometimes they separate them. So when they're united, then these so-called relationships appear, like uh, I'm the servant, he's the master, or I'm the master, and he's the servant, or uh, this is my partner in life, and these are my offspring, like this. The straws are floating together, and then the current separates them in different ways, most noticeably death. But there are other ways that they separate also. So Bhaktivinoda Thakur, in his song, he writes, Maya vase yacha bese kachaha badubhubai jiv krishna das evishvash karli tara dukanai Bhaktivinoda Thakur states that all men and women are floating like straws in the waves of material nature. If they come to the understanding that they are eternal servants of Krishna, they will put an end to this floating condition. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, Kama Esha Krota Esha Rajaguna Samudbhava Due to the mode of passion, we desire many things, and according to our desire or anxiety, and according to the order of the Supreme Lord, material nature gives us a certain type of body. For some time we play as master or servant, as actors play on the stage under someone else's direction. While we're in the human form, we should put an end to this nonsensical stage performance. We should come to our original constitutional position known as Krishna consciousness. Mm. Yeah, under the influence of the modes of material nature, we take on these temporary roles and people serve each other in forgetfulness of the real master, the real servant, Krishna. So basically serving material nature. Like Jad Bharat was saying, who's the master and who's the servant? This is all being conducted by the modes of material nature. And when we identify with those modes of material nature, then we, um, we forget our spiritual nature and we think this is our master or this is who we serve over here or this person's serving me, whatever. He says it's like we play. It's like a play on a stage under someone else's direction. The whole thing is like a stage play. And that is the modes of material nature are directing everything. It's according to desires to enjoy the material nature. Then we come under the jurisdiction of the modes of material nature. And then the performance ensues. 
is we identify with the part we're playing on the stage. I think that's who we are. Bhaktivinod says we should put an end to this nonsensical stage performance. We come to our original constitutional position, Krishna consciousness. At the present moment, the real master is material nature. Under the spell of material nature, we're becoming servants and masters. But if we agree to be controlled by the Supreme Personality of Godhead and His eternal servants, His temporary condition ceases to exist. Under the spell. But if we are, we're going to be controlled, but if we agree to be controlled, by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Supreme Spiritual Being on the spiritual platform, and His eternal servants, the temporary condition ceases to exist. Well, guess what? The temporary condition is going to cease to exist anyway. wherever this birth is death. So why not take just one lifetime and go, and go for it. Go for the spiritual, spiritual goal. Go for the prize, Krishna consciousness. Material body is going to end anyway. Sooner or later, no one knows when, it's not always someone reaches a ripe old age. Could be in the next moment. So, there's no time like the present <laughs> to agree to be controlled by the Supreme Personality of Godhead rather than agree to be controlled by those under the jurisdiction of the material energy. If, you agree, if we agree to be controlled by those under the jurisdiction of material energy, then we come under the jurisdiction of material energy. If we agree to be controlled by the Supreme Personality of Godhead and His representatives, pure devotees and associates, then we come under the jurisdiction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead his devotees and associates. That's what's meant by marginal energy. It's who we agree to be controlled by. So, it's actually a choice. We have a choice. And the more we hear, hear about Krishna, hear about our actual situation, hear about the pastimes of the Lord, then the more we become attracted and the more we want to be controlled by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, His devotees and His associates. Because we experience a higher taste, which ever increases and is never satiated. Now the material experience is never satiated also, but it's, it's because it's temporary and, but the, when the spiritual, we say the spiritual um, is never satiated, it means it's ever increasing, it means there's no end. So it's extremely blissful, but materially it's always interrupted. There's some little bit of um, sense enjoyment, um, some little bit of uh, ego uh, reinforcement, false ego reinforcement, <laughs> all illusory, and it's always interrupted. And the uh, the condition is always 
desiring to have something that we don't have, and then if we do happen to it, attain it, whatever it is, then we're afraid we'll lose it. So we're never happy. <laughs> but spiritually, it's never lost. Whatever service one does for the Lord accumulates, never lost, and is ever increasing. So two different types of natures. So if we agree to be controlled by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, then we attain that nature, ever blissful, ever expanding, unlimited, ecstatic, personal, <laughs> joyful, <laughs> full of knowledge, Hey. So that's what's being offered by uh, Lord Chaitanya Sankirtan movement, throwing the, the doors wide open. Anyone who's hungry, come on. <laughs> Anyone and everyone, just opening it, opening it up. So this is Jud Bharat, way back in the creation of the universe, speaking the same eternal truths. And Jud Bharat is like seventh or eighth generation, ninth generation, something like that. He's speaking the same eternal truths that are spoken to Arjuna, the Bhagavad Gita, 5,000 years ago same eternal truths that are being presented by the pure devotee representatives in the disciplic succession today. It doesn't change. So this is text 13. My dear king, you have said, you rascal, you dull crazy fellow, I'm going to chastise you and then you'll come to your senses. In this regard, let me say that although I live like a dull, deaf, and dumb man, I'm actually a self-realized person. What will you gain by punishing me? If your calculation is true, and I'm a madman, then your punishment will be like beating a dead horse. There will be no effect. When a madman is punished, he's not cured of his madness. Uh, talk about straightforward. Devotees are always straightforward. Very straightforward. Oh, you're going to punish me? Well, <laughs> I'm a self-realized soul. What good will punishing me do? But even if you think I'm a dullard and a madman, what good will punishment do? You can't change me if I'm actually a dullard. You can't change that by punishing me. So what's with all this punishment stuff? <laughs> we learned earlier that Maharaj Ruhugana had become overcome with rage because uh, his, of his involvement with the mode of passion and ignorance. And uh, so he became easily enraged. And this is like uh, just the mode of passion speaking here <laughs> in Maharaj Ruhugana. So, uh, commentary. Everyone in this material world is working like a madman under certain impressions falsely acquired in the material condition. For example, a thief who knows that stealing is not good and who knows it is followed with punishment by the king or by God, who has seen that thieves are arrested and punished by the police, nevertheless steals again and again. He's obsessed with the idea that by stealing he'll be happy. Sign of madness. Despite repeated punishment, the thief cannot give up his stealing habit. Therefore, the punishment is useless. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. Reward and punishment. carrot on a stick and the whip. 
And most of the world, actually the whole world, is running on that. Afraid of being punished and running after what they consider a reward. But no one has changed. And if a religious system functions simply on that uh, reward and punishment dynamic, then the person isn't changed. How will they be changed? It says here that repeated punishment, a thief cannot give up the stealing habit. Why? Because he thinks stealing will make him happy. So until the idea of what will make a person happy changes. The stealing isn't going to go away, or the, the lower activity isn't going to go away until this principle of higher taste, you get a higher taste of what will make me happy. If I do this, I think it'll make me happy. That's why I do it. Even though every time I do it, I'm miserable. <laughs> Whatever it is, whatever the undesirable activity is, because a person thinks it will make them happy. And they get punished, and they go ahead and they do it again. And they get punished, and they go ahead and they do it again. Why? Because they don't get a taste for something that will actually make them happy. A higher taste. So this system is useless. This is uh, Prabhupada's commentary. And this was known to Jad Bharat way back in the beginning of the universe. The system of punishment. Text 14. Well, maybe for an animal, you know, if you... You want the animal to perform a certain way, like training oxen, you know, you, or any animal. If you, they do something that is what the, um, the the trainer likes, they give them a little treat. And if they do something that is undesirable and they get a little smack, a little whip or something, and then they get the idea of what kind of behavior. And so they always want to go toward the reward, so. But that's just on a behavioral level. And that's an animal. The human beings are different. Because even if a human being is punished, they will use their intelligence how to try again. They don't accept the punishment because they have that idea of what will make them happy. Whereas with an animal, that holding that idea evidently isn't there. That's the difference between the human being and the animal, is the human being can use their intelligence so that's a case of misguided intelligence. My intelligence says this will make me happy. So that's material intelligence. And if there's some external system of punishment and reward imposed by someone else acting under the modes of material nature, it doesn't affect that intelligence. They still hold on to that. The idea of what will make me happy and can distinguish, oh, these are external restrictions being imposed on me, but that's not going to change my intelligence of what I think. So that's the difference between the, the animal doesn't have that capability to hold within the mind and intelligence something as different from the external forces acting on them. So when that intelligence is purified in the human being, and they can begin to perceive their spiritual nature, which is definitely different from the external restrictions being placed. Hmm. 
Hoi, ik kom in daar. Zo, tekst 14. Ah. Sukadev Goswami said, O Maharaj Pariksit, when King Rahugana chastised the exalted devotee Jad Bharat with harsh words, that peaceful saintly person tolerated it all and replied properly. Nescience is due to bodily conception, and Jad Bharat was not affected by, false, by this false conception. Out of his natural humility, he never considered himself a great devotee, and he agreed to suffer the results of his past karma. Like an ordinary man, he thought that by carrying the palakin, he was destroying the reactions of his past misdeeds. Thinking in this way, he began to carry the palakin as before. Hmm. Out of his natural humility, he didn't consider himself a great devotee. He didn't expect any preferential treatment. He didn't think that because he's a pure devotee of the Lord that somehow his material body should be uh, given preferential treatment somehow. He agreed to suffer the results of any past karma. Whether he actually had past karma or not is maybe something that will be discussed. But his mentality was that he didn't consider himself to be special in any way. Just that he was self-realized and he was very uh, self-satisfied with that. And then whatever he had to deal with in terms of being ordered by this one or ordered by that one or being forced to work this way or forced to work that way, he just accepted it, that he was working off some sort of karma. So, <laughs> Hare Krishna, self-satisfied. Prabhupada's uh, commentary. An exalted devotee of the Lord never thinks that he's a Paramahamsa or a liberated soul. He always remains a humble servant of the Lord. In all reverse conditions, he agrees to suffer the results of his past life. He never accuses the Lord of putting him in a distressed condition. These are the signs of an exalted devotee. Tate nukampam sushama shamana. When suffering reversed conditions, the devotee always considers the reversed conditions are the Lord's concessions. He's never angry with his master. He's always satisfied with the position his master offers. In any case, he continues performing his duty and devotional service. Such a person is guaranteed promotion back home, back to Godhead, as stated in Bhagavatam. Mm. The devotee always considers that the reverse conditions are the Lord's concessions. Concessions. It would be safe to say here that a concession is when some allowance is made, some concession. In other words, the reverse condition should have been a lot worse, but the Lord made some concession for his devotee, and so it's not as bad as it really should have been according to the laws of karma. That it's the Lord's concession, this, this reverse, should have been a lot worse. Hmm. Such a person is guaranteed promotion back home, back to Godhead, as stated in the Bhagavatam, Tate nukampam sushamik shamano bunjana evatma kritam vipakam ridvag vapurbir ridadan amaste jiveta yo mukti pade sadayabhak. 
My dear Lord, one who constantly waits for your causeless mercy to be bestowed upon him and who goes on suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds, offering you respectful obeisances from the core of his heart, is surely eligible for liberation, for it has become his rightful claim. And goes on suffering the reactions of his past misdeeds, offering you respectful obeisances from the core of his heart. The devotee always thinks that he's helpless, really. So whatever the condition is, there's really no way for the person to change it. So you have to wait for the causeless mercy of the Lord. And if the condition changes or it doesn't change, whatever. Because it, all the devotee really wants is that relationship with, of love and devotion with the Lord, whatever the situation is. And the Lord will never give a, a devotee more than they can deal with. So, someone, a devotee may find themselves in a, in a destitute condition sometimes. It's not punishment. It's because that devotee may not be able to deal with material opulence very nicely. And it may be an impediment to their devotion that because they may tend to be distracted by a lot of material opulence. So they might find themselves in a, a kind of poor condition, but they're protected. So that that relationship with the Lord can grow and not be disturbed by too much dealing with the material energy, senses becoming disturbed and agitated. So to make some big extra endeavor to try to make a lot of money and get out of a, a kind of poor condition is not a good idea. And without the Lord's mercy, it wouldn't happen anyway. So for the devotee to simply depend on the Lord's arrangements By always in striving to engage in the Lord's service, in whatever situation a devotee finds himself, they will be provided for. Sometimes they may not care for the way, the, the provisions that are being provided, but that's another story. Those, times, those are the times when they simply accept what's being provided. But the main thing is to continually strive to be engaged in the devotional service of the Lord. And the more the devotee does that, the more they'll find that they're relieved from having to struggle very hard with the material nature and that they will be provided for. All that you offer, all that you give away, all activities that you perform, all sacrifices, all austerities should be done as an offering to me. And then surely you'll come to me. So whatever situation in life a person finds themselves, all their activities can be dedicated in devotional service to the Lord. It's a matter of consciousness. Text 15. 
Sukadev Goswami continued, O best of the Pandu dynasty, Maharaj Pariksit. Now, offering all of one's activities to the Lord from the previous verse, there's a science for doing that, of devotional service. And that's why the association of the devotees, pure devotees, the mentors, the spiritual masters, the scriptures, because they show us how to do that, how to give all our activities. So we want to stay in contact with the devotional culture by hearing and chanting and associating with the devotees to whatever degree we can and taking guidance from the spiritual master and performing practical service also for the spiritual master. This is a great science of devotional service. It's not some abstract, ephemeral thing. It's actually um, very precise science, spiritual science. Spiritual energy is energy. It's not imagination. It's in it, it's one of the one of the Lord's energies is devotional energy, just like He has material energy. He has spiritual energies also. So this is the science of the spiritual energy of devotion, and there are teachers, and there is a science. And that's what is coming through the disciplic succession in its purest form is the science of devotional service. It's pretty big. <laughs> but wherever someone contacts this devotional culture, this pure devotional culture, it has the same absolute quality. It's like, uh, an example is like a gingerbread man cookie, gingerbread man. So wherever someone bites into the cookie, it's the same gingerbread. <laughs> the absolute nature of Krishna consciousness and devotional service bite into the gingerbread cookie on the, the toe of the gingerbread man or into the finger or you bite the head off, whatever, and the cookie. It's the same gingerbread. So. This is uh, start text 15 again. Sukadev Goswami continued, O best of the Pandu dynasty, Maharaj Prikshit, the king of the Sindhu and Savira states, Maharaj Rahugana, had great faith in discussions of the Absolute Truth. Being thus qualified, he heard from Jad Bharat that philosophical presentation which is approved by all scriptures on the mystic yoga process and which slackens the knot in the heart. His material conception of himself as a king was thus destroyed. He immediately descended from his palanquin, fell flat on the ground with his head at the lotus feet of Jad Bharat. In such a way, he might be excused for his insulting words against the great Brahmin. He then prayed as follows. So, thus being qualified, he was qualified because he had developed some faith in discussions of the Absolute Truth. He had some faith that there was an Absolute Truth and he appreciated the discussions of the Absolute Truth. He had that, although he was obviously identifying with the material nature and so, but because he had that little bit of faith like that, when he met this great devotee, immediately he got the mercy. Immediately he surrendered. 
and he he got he got uh, he got delivered at that point. He had that little bit of faith, and when he met the representative, the empowered spiritual personality, Judd Barat, he took the mercy. It says he fell on the ground. Now this is the king, right? He fell flat on the ground with his head at the lotus feet of Judd Barat. Hmm. Prabhupada's commentary. Lord Krishna says in Bhagavad Gita, Evam param para praptam imam rajasya vidhu na kalaneha mahata yoga nashta parantapa. The supreme science was thus received through the chain of disciplic succession, and saintly kings understood it in that way. But in course of time, the succession was broken, and therefore the science as it appears to be lost. The science as it is appears to be lost. Through the disciplic succession, the royal order was on the same platform as great saintly persons, Rajarishis. Formerly, they could understand the philosophy of life and knew how to train the citizens to come to the same standard. In other words, they knew how to deliver the citizens from the entanglement of birth and death. When Maharaj Dasarath ruled Ayodhya, the great sage Vishwamrita once came to him to take away Lord Ramachandra and Lakshman to the forest to kill a demon. When the saintly person Vishwamrita came to the court of Maharaj Dasarath, the king, in order to receive the saintly person, asked him whether everything was going on well in his endeavor to conquer the repetition of birth and death. The whole process of Vedic civilization is based on this point. We must know how to conquer the repetition of birth and death. Hmm. So the king is conquering enemies of the state and the great saints and sages are conquering the enemies of ignorance. An illusion. Hmm. So it's interesting when Dasarath met Vishwamrita, he talked to him like one king talking to another. So Maharaj Dasarath inquired from Vishwamrita, In your battle, how are things going? In the battle against the repetition of birth and death and ignorance. How are things going? Huh. Wow. So the whole process of Vedic civilization is based on this point. Mm. It's the Varnashram system. We must know how to conquer the repetition of birth and death. Maharaj Rahugana also knew the purpose of life. Therefore, when Jad Bharat put the philosophy of life before him, he immediately appreciated it. This is the foundation of Vedic society. Learned scholars, Brahmins, saintly persons, and sages, who were fully aware of the Vedic purpose, advised the royal order how to benefit the general masses, and by their co cooperation the general masses were benefited. Therefore everything was successful. Maharaj Rahugana attained this perfection of understanding the value of human life. Therefore he regretted his insulting words to Jad Bharat. He immediately descended from his palanquin, fell down at the lotus feet of Jad Bharat, in order to be excused and to hear from him further about the values of life known as Brahma Jignasa, inquiry into the Absolute Truth. At the present moment, high government officials are ignorant of the values of life, 
And when saintly persons endeavor to broadcast Vedic knowledge, the so-called executives do not offer their respectful obeisances, but try to obstruct the spiritual propaganda. Thus, one can say that the former kingly government was like heaven, and the present government is like hell. Mm. Maharaj Rahugana had a taste, a personal taste also. It wasn't just a matter of duty, but he had a personal taste for transcendental subject matter. And he wanted to hear more about the absolute truth. Not just so he could be a better king, but so that he could develop spiritually also. And he had that service of also looking after the welfare of others. So one of the best ways to do that is by personal example. I mean, if there's a shipwreck and everyone's drowning, how can anyone help anyone else unless they themselves find something to climb up on and get out of the drowning condition? You climb up on a raft or a little lifeboat or something, then they can reach their hand out to others. But if they're also drowning, how are they going to help anybody? It's like uh, you go on the airplane, they always, on the jet, they always give that little speech in the beginning about the airbags. The little stewardess or steward gets up there and, in the event that we need this, and you take the airbag down and it's hanging from the top and then and put it on yourself first and then help those around you. So Maharaj Rahugana, he's going to help other people. He's going to have to be also situated on the spiritual platform himself. So he has that taste and he's his good fortune knows no bounds. His, he must be in ecstasy, really, to meet someone like Jud Bharat. Totally ecstatic. It's a very ecstatic moment. Fell on the ground at his feet. I mean, sword, helmet, golden decorations, armor, whatever he's wearing, the whole thing. <laughs> at the feet of Jud Bharat. So... Such is the nature of someone that the Supreme Lord has taken residence in. We read earlier that the personality of God in himself was residing in Jad Bharat. The Lord personally takes shelter within the surrendered devotee. Why? Because the Lord is attracted to the devotion. The Lord is the all-attractive personality of Godhead, but the Lord himself is attracted to devotion, devotional service. So what a great, what a great meeting that is. What a great meeting. A good, great good fortune, Maharaja Hugana. And Jadbarat also, he's wandering around. He has this realization and he's, where's the opportunity to share it for him? Uh, now his opportunity, he can speak. So ecstatic for him, ecstatic for Raharaj Rahugana, and ecstatic for us. And this is the nature of the Bhagavatam. It, this Bhagavatam gives accounts of these different encounters of persons ready to hear with persons who are qualified to speak. There are many, many accounts of the Bhagavatam like this. And really, it's the conversation between Maharaj Pritchett and Sukadev Goswami. Maharaj Pritchett is ready to hear, and Sukadev Goswami is ready to speak. And then there are many other conversations within that main conversation that have that same quality, where someone is enlightened by the pure representative. 
So we can catch the essence of that if we hear these accounts and these conversations. We can we are associating on that spiritual level. And then if we're ready to hear, then we can we get the benefit because we're ready to hear. And Bhagavatam is speaking. Bhagavatam is literary incarnation of Krishna. Krishna is residing within the Bhagavatam, just like he's residing within the pure devotee. There's person Bhagavat and book Bhagavat. So the personality of Godhead is residing in the devotee, like Jad Bharat. He's also residing in the Bhagavatam. Why? Because of the devotion there. He's present in his holy name. specifically the Hare Krishna Mara Mantra. He says he personally invests his energy and resides within that holy name. And whenever anyone utters the holy name, he accepts that as devotional service. That's the incredible mercy. He's personally there receiving whatever service a person can do to the Holy Name. Even if it's not very nice, the way they say the Holy Name. He is accepting that service as devotion. Well, have to research that a little bit more if he's accepting it as devotion or he's simply accepting it because the holy name may also be killing some demons here and there so devotion is devotion if someone he's not accepting the offense that's what it is if there's devotion he's definitely accepting that because that's what he wants but if the holy name is uttered in a different way, not particularly devotional. He's accepting it as service. He's not accepting the offense. Yes, that's what it is. He accepts it as service. He doesn't see the offense. I don't know, did he do that with Putana? He accepted her service. She approached him as a mother, <clears throat> but not with devotion. She actually wanted to kill him and put poison on her breast and then tried to uh, breastfeed the child, Krishna, with poison. But he didn't accept the poison. He accepted her service. He accepted her as a mother. So maybe something like that when people utter the holy name but it's not devotionally. He doesn't accept the offense. He doesn't accept whatever poison is coming. He only accepts that they're chanting the holy name. Must be something like that. Of course, Putana received liberation. Liberated platform is a good platform to go back to Godhead from because from there there's an opportunity to engage in devotional service. We were just reading, the more one is freed from the bodily conception of life, the more one has the opportunity to engage in devotional service, the more one engages in devotional service, the more one becomes happy and peaceful. So it's essential to get to that platform of liberation. So Krishna's offering that for anyone who chants the holy name and a lot more. So I'll stop there.
Hare Krishna.